Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here today. I'm Sharon Mary Minai with the SEOW facilitator team here at the Center for Drug and Health Studies. Um, we know how important uh, this topic is of overdose and it's, it's heavy, but I think there's a great deal of interest in it. And we're really grateful for all of you for um, your time today and participating in this meeting. Um, I would like to ask everyone to just sign into the chat, introduce yourself and say what agency you're representing. We know that there are a lot of folks here that we have seen for years that are participating in um, SEOW events um, longstanding. And we also know we have some new folks here. So it would be great to just uh, get a sense of who's in the room. And once again, thank you. We'll get started in a few minutes. Good morning, Yvonne. It's great to see you. Hi, Nicole, Aaron, Tatiana, welcome. Nicole and Sean, Nuno, Laurie, Tim, Sherbra, Peggy. Good morning, Alexa, Bernice, and Chris, Carol Ann. Okay, we'll give it an, another minute for folks to sign in. Uh, and then we'll just start with some general overview of today's meeting. If you're just joining us, um, please sign in and let us know where you're coming from today. Hi, Angela. Okay, MJ, do you think we should go ahead and get started now? Yes, ma'am, that would be great. Okay, all right. So again, my name is Sharon Merriman Nye. I'm here at the Center for Drug and Health Studies at the University of Delaware, and we facilitate the State Epidemiological Outcomes Work Group, um, or we know it more, um, more likely as the SEOW. Um, this is our second semi-annual meeting uh, for the year. We meet twice as a large network. Um, and then we have some events throughout the year uh, for, you know, the public in general, uh, as well as members of the network. Uh, basically, the SEOW is a network of stakeholders who are interested in using data, promoting the use of data, sharing data for the purposes of preventative um, care and behavioral health. Um, we are funded through the Department of Health uh, for Health and Social Services at the state level uh, by the through the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, and the funding comes through the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Next slide. So today, as I mentioned, um, we have a very timely topic, a very serious topic. Um, we're going to be discussing overdoses. But we're also going to talk about not only the data, but what community innovators are doing um, in the state to help address this issue. Um, we'll start off with some welcome and introductions. Then we'll look at the SEOW goals, a few new data products that we've created. Uh, we have a data champion that we will be presenting um, a recognition to. It's one of our favorite parts of the meeting. And then we'll feature uh, a presentation by um, Tim Hewling and Chris Sutton on overdose data in the state. And then we'll have some community innovators speaking to us from Network Connect and from the Sussex County Health Coalition. We'll break into small groups and talk about the data, what we've learned and what we've learned about the prevention efforts. And then we'll come back as a group, discuss what we all talked about in our breakout rooms, and we'll have a network share out. Um, 
I'd like to just start by saying we have a number of our SEOW facilitator team members in the room. Um, MJ Scales is the, um, the, the leader of the initiative here at the university. We have Dana Holtz, Rachel Riding, Bill Gratton, Rochelle Brittingham. Um, who, am I, who am I missing out of our team? Um, Christy Vischer, who is the head of the, um, the Center for Drug and Health Studies. And we have a number of our research associates, um, graduate research associates that are here today as well. And we are, um, and I see David Borton is in the room, uh, Bill Gratton, Emily Rell, Angela Brown, uh, Carol Ann Charo. Um, we, am I missing anybody, MJ? I don't think so, Sharon. Okay. Uh, I think you've all talked to a number of us. Some of you work with different ones of us on different projects, but um, we we approach the SEOW as a team. We like to, um, you know, we like to get out into the community. We work with stakeholders in terms of identifying data and generating data products that meet your needs. So um, if, if this is the first time that you've attended an SEOW meeting, what we would like to do now is invite you to unmike yourself, I mean, unmute yourself and say who you are, what your interest in the data is. Um, if you're not comfortable doing that, you can certainly note that in the chat instead, but we would like to hear from folks at this time. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Laurie Lucinski at BB Healthcare. I'm um, joining this meeting for the first time at the invitation of Kim Blanche, who's also on the call. Um, and I am supporting uh, our uh, implementation of several behavioral health substance use disorder treatment grants um, here at BB. Well, welcome, Laurie. Thank you. And thank you, Kim, for inviting Laurie. It's great to have BB represented here. Thank you. Any other new folks that would like to introduce themselves? My name is Nicole Sapp. I'm the new epidemiologist here at the Office of EMS. Um, I was previously involved with the Delaware Drug Monitoring Initiative um, with my former employer. I'm now with the Office of EMS. I've been here for about four weeks now, and my primary responsibility will be opioid surveillance. Thank you for joining us. We're, we're really grateful to have you here, Nicole, and welcome. Good luck in your new position. I'm Thank sure we'll you. be talking more over time. Any other new folks? Hi, my name is Haja. Uh, I'm not new because I came last year, but I'm new in my position as a um, HDM data, HGMI data analyst with the public health department. I do remember you, and I'm happy to see that you're in this new position. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Any other newcomers? See, this is where we miss our in-person meetings because, um, you know, we used to be able to have a lot more informal dialogue at the beginning of the meeting where people got to meet one another, but we try our best in the Zoom world. Anyone else want to introduce themselves at this time? Okay. Well, I'm going to at this Rachel, will you go ahead and advance the slide? Yes. All right, thank you, Sharon. Um, so um, as Sharon gave a good overview of the SEOW, and for anybody who is new to our group this time, um, I just want to highlight the four primary goals of the SEOW and the work that we do every year. Um, the first goal is to build monitoring and surveillance systems to identify, analyze, and profile data from state and local sources. Uh, the second goal of the SEOW is to identify, share, and analyze data. Our third goal is to create data-guided products that inform prevention planning and policies. Um, and our fourth goal is to train agencies and communities in understanding, using, and presenting data effectively. And you know, throughout the year, we release um, new data products. We host um, two 
big SEOW meetings like this one throughout the year. And we also do um, a 3D webinar series throughout the year on special topics. Um, and in the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of the things that we've done since our last SEOW meeting in January. Um, first is a new infographic on bullying using Delaware youth data um, to look at some of the things that we see in some um, school survey data about um, trends in bullying among, among youth and some of those um, patterns and things to look out for. Um, and I'll show a highlight of um, that infographic in one of the following slides. Um, we also have a new short report on overdoses um, that will be posted to our website and available very soon. Um, and I have a, a couple snapshots of that in an upcoming slide. And our uh, most recent 3D webinar, um, and if you're new, 3D stands for Delaware Data Discourse. Um, in our most recent 3D webinar, um, we presented highlights from our 2021 state epidemiological profile. Um, the EPI report is a big report we put out on an annual basis. Um, work is underway on the 2022 EPI report, which should be released um, later this fall. And we're very excited. Um, we have access to um, more data this year, um, so we should be able to fill in fill in some of the gaps that we had last year in our data due to some of the pandemic constraints. Um, but if you missed the three, our most recent 3D um, where we presented um, the 2021 EPI report, that was recorded um, and that recording is available on our YouTube channel um, if you want to check that out and kind of see the latest data that we were able to report. And here is um, a snapshot of that bullying infographic that um, we produced earlier this year. Um, and this is available on our website. Um, and I believe there's probably a link being dropped to it in the chat, um, just highlighting a couple key data points around bullying with youth in Delaware and also highlighting um, resources and information sources um, on the topic of bullying. And um, as I mentioned, our, um, we've put together a short report on drug overdoses in Delaware. Um, Dr. Dana Holtz put this together for folks. Um, and looking at some of the trend data and overdoses in Delaware, and also um, focusing a little bit more on fentanyl-involved overdoses. So there's some pretty good information in here. Um, and again, this report um, should be available online very, very soon. So we're excited to be able to share that with you because we know this is a topic that folks are wanting more information about right now. And with that, I will turn it back over to MJ to present our data champion. Thanks, Rachel. Um, unfortunately, our data champion isn't here yet. So um, I'll make a, a comment about today. And then if we uh, if they join before I'm done, great. If not, we'll just make sure they get their certificate and we'll mention um, how awesome they are without them being here. So as Sharon mentioned, um, this can be a tough topic. This is a very heavy topic at times. And so we want to acknowledge that we're going to have some great data shared today. Uh, but there are people behind this data, right? And so we as a team recognize that, you know, lives are being lost to overdose and it's an important uh, health priority, but it also uh, impacts many of us directly. And we want to take a moment to acknowledge that and honor the the lives that have been lost to overdose. So thank you for being here today to share and learn with us. We're, we're appreciative of your time uh, because that's important as well. So thank you for that. Um, one person who, who challenges us, even though she's not here today, to always see the people behind the data and who is a, um, literally is turning data into action is our community partner and education partner, uh, Dr. Terry Lawler. Um, you can go to the next slide, even though she's not here, she'll see the recording. and. Um, but anyway, she is an amazing person. She is definitely uh, a data warrior. She is constantly saying, but what does the data say? And then pushing us to understand what the data means and who's represented in that data. So I appreciate her as a partner and um, appreciate her insight and the way she uses data for uh, a number of different things and also pushes us as a team to be better. So I thank her for I know she was unable to be here this morning, but I appreciate her and we'll make sure she gets that certificate. So thank you very much. Um, next, I believe, is our main presenter, right? I think that's the next line. Yes. Great. So um, I am really honored 
poor to uh, learn alongside you all with our two main presenters today, uh, Tim Hewlings and Sergeant Chris Sutton. Tim Hewlings is currently a public health analyst with the CDC Foundation, and Sergeant Chris Sutton is with Delaware State Police. They're going to go over um, some the DMI report and provide some context and some information. You should have received this report in your email. If you didn't uh, see it, maybe check your spam folder. It may be there as well. This is really um, exciting information in so much that it's it's comprehensive data. Uh, I, for me, I'm having a full circle moment. Uh, I came to Delaware about six years ago, just under six years ago, and one of the very first presenters um, that I heard was Tim Hewlings talking about, about this data. So thank you all for your uh, time and attention. After they present, it will be... Um, we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A, so if you hold on to those questions, we'll jump right into that. Thank you so much, and now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hewlings and Sergeant Sutton. Yeah, and I'm going to end my screen share because I believe our presenters will be advancing their own slides, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so I will stop my share so y'all can share your slides. Is that okay? Looks great. Okay, good. Okay, Chris, are you on? I am. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Hewlings. I'm joined today with uh, Sergeant Chris Sutton of the Delaware State Police. I'd like to thank MJ and Sharon for inviting us to speak today and uh, getting the message out. Uh, Chris is the analytical supervisor at the Delaware Information and Analysis Center, otherwise known as DIAC, and he'll tell you more about his background. Good morning. My name is uh, Sergeant Christopher Sutton. I am about to start my 20th year with the Delaware State Police. Uh, during my career, I've been assigned as both a patrol uh, to patrol as a trooper and as a supervisor. I spent several years in investigative units to include our drug unit, our career criminal unit, and retail theft. Uh, presently, I am assigned as the analytical supervisor at DIAC. In that role, I supervise the Intel analyst at DIAC, which is you know, Delaware's Fusion Center. If you're not familiar with Fusion Centers, they are information sharing hubs located throughout the country as part of a national network. Uh, there are currently 78 uh, Fusion Centers throughout the United States and its territories, to include Guam and the last Fusion Center that was uh, spun up in Western Pennsylvania. DIAC is the official fusion center for Delaware. Uh, the focus is on homeland security issues. As part of that network, DIAC has forged valuable relationships with our state partners. Go ahead, Tim. And I also served as a trooper with the state police and I retired at the end of 2020 after 31 years. Uh, over the years, I mainly served in investigative intelligence and homeland security roles. While at DIAC and toward the end of my career, I had very close interaction with public health and worked collaboratively on several projects, and DMI was one of them. This interaction inc increased my interest and helped me segue into my current role. In November of 2020, I started work as a public health analyst with the CDC Foundation as part of a newly formed and growing national network known as the Overdose Response Strategy, or ORS. It's really been interesting working on the public health side, trying to reduce overdose incidents by building relationships, increasing sharing, and supporting promising efforts. The intent of the ORS program is to increase the interaction and sharing between public health and public safety through embedded ORS teams in at least every state in the country. Some states like California and Florida have more than one team. Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands also have teams. I say teams because I work in conjunction with a drug intelligence officer, otherwise known as a DIO, who is employed by HIDA. And HIDA is the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program. We cover Delaware and split our time between Delaware Public Health and the Delaware Information and Analysis Center, DIAC. HIDA has 33 regions in the country and covers about two thirds of the US. Delaware falls under the Liberty Mid-Atlantic HIDA, which covers Philadelphia, in several surrounding counties in Pennsylvania and in Southern New Jersey. Today, we will provide an in-depth look at 
the Delaware DMI. We will review the history, evolution, contributors, and we'll discuss their contributions. As Tim mentioned, the effort started in 2016 and the relationships have strengthened over the last six years. Quarterly and annual reports have been consistently produced since that time. Next slide. DMI was born out of a National Governors Association conference. In August of 2016, my boss asked me to cover this three-day meeting in DC for him. Uh, he left out the part of this assignment coming with years of follow-up work. And to this day, he promises it was not a setup. Uh, in DC, I joined Cabinet Secretary Rita Landgraf from the Delaware Department of Health and Social Services and representatives from the Delaware Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, the Delaware Office of EMS and Preparedness, and the Delaware Division of Forensic Science. Delaware was one of five states represented at this, at this meeting. The New Jersey State Police and their DMI team invented the DMI framework and set the gold standard. They were kind enough to help other states adopt their model at that conference. In my opinion, they still lead the way and continue to be very willing to share everything they have. I still participate in their online meetings and benefit from their continued information sharing. Uh, on the call, uh, I'd also like to recognize uh, DPH epidemiologist Nicole Sapp. We met her in the intro, but Nicole was with DMI from the very beginning. And uh, you know, over the last six years, uh, she was instrumental in developing DMI, continuing DMI, and nurturing the close partnerships that we've had with our, uh, our DMI partners. So I just want to recognize her on the call as well. In 2018, my boss, my boss again asked me to cover a National Governors Association meeting, this time in Kentucky, and again with a team of Delaware representatives. I had, I had some deja vu, but this time I had a little bit more information leading up to the event. Uh, this effort was intended to increase better multidisciplinary sharing related to infectious disease, primarily related to IV drug use. With the progress and relationships that we developed through DMI, our group decided to roll this effort into DMI with the Communicable Disease Bureau joining the Delaware DMI team. It made perfect, perfect sense for Delaware then and still does. The next slide current reflects the current DMI agencies, the leadership and the contributors. Many names have changed, but each agency is still closely engaged in this partnership. As a matter of fact, we had a great DMI revisit meeting this past March and we are collectively and continuously looking for ways to increase the DMI content and reach. The DMI partners have some things in the works. Now we will move into the individual contributors from each agency and discuss the specific content. content. The Division of Forensic Science contributes death numbers and toxicology. They also provide a breakdown by uh, death by age, sex, race, and also by county. Accurate death numbers are always a very sought after piece of information. Forensic science is the sole source for this information. These numbers are published in DMI and they are the official numbers. We are continuously encountering new drugs on our streets. Some of the newly formulated mixtures, others are resurrected recipes concocted with illicit drug labs. Others are known substances not commonly known as drugs of abuse. The DMI team works very closely with forensic science to keep abreast of these changing substances. Next slide. DIAC provides data for all 48 police agencies in Delaware. This includes arrest numbers and for which drugs, type of drugs, excuse me. There's also a specific breakdown for opioid arrests, race, sex, age, county, and county information is also provided. Delaware is fortunate because there is a central repository for all police information. A parking ticket, a traffic ticket, an accident report, and all crime reports are housed and maintained by the Delaware Criminal Justice Information System, otherwise known as DELGIS. DIAC has been given permission from DELGIS to access, view, and analyze all this information for all the police agencies in Delaware. Next, we have 
a data, we have data from the Office of Emergency Medical Services. They track naloxone patients, those who receive naloxone from EMS, as well as naloxone administrations, the number of doses to include the number of doses given. In addition, they track the top location type, whether it be a residence, a hotel, on the street, of where the overdoses are occurring. They also provide the primary impression of the impatient of the patients. That is the most serious problem affecting the patient at that time. OEMS also tracks the number of patients administered naloxone by public safety officials, such as the police. As Tim mentioned earlier, Nicole is now working at the office of EMS. She will still be involved as a part of the DMI team. It'll be interesting to see how her perspective changes or in evolves uh, in her new surroundings. The Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, DSAM, provides data on treatment admissions and the primary drug for which treatment is being sought. They also provide data on treatment facilities with the top 10 facilities being noted. Lastly, there is also a breakdown for age, sex, race, and county. Slide. Currently, the Communicable Disease Bureau is providing information on HIV cases. Same coverage with race, sex, age, and county. We are striving to include more information such as hepatitis, endocrinitis, and bacteriological infections, conditions often resulting from IV drug use. Okay, I'd like to mention the, the final section we'd like to cover is the uh, of the DMI report is the key findings section. Each contributing agency looks at their data and their analysis and provides relevant findings. These are the important takeaways from the report noted by the contributors. And a few final other notes. Uh, nothing in DMI contains PII or personally identifiable information. Therefore, it alleviates HIPAA and law enforcement privacy concerns. In addition, each contributing agency never loses control of their information. They own the information and contribute it to DMI for the report, essentially as their chapter in the report. Uh, there's an understanding that no agency will share any part of the DMI until the report is approved and disseminated. After that, each contributor is free to talk about the group effort and can present on you know, the entire report if, uh, if it's desired or uh, requested. And uh, that pretty much concludes our uh, presentation. We, uh, we did, as MJ said, send out the latest version of DMI to kind of give you the framework and uh, show you what essentially goes into each report. So we'd like to open it up to any uh, any questions or discussions. I think we have uh, probably 43 people on here. So if anybody has any questions or anything, uh, uh, Sergeant Sutton and I are, are here to answer any questions. I wanna thank Sergeant Sutton and Mr. Hewings for that that overview. If you've ever read that report, there's quite a bit of data in there. And if you're not familiar with all the, the ins and the outs, um, it can, you know, get you can get lost in it. I'd like to invite, there are no questions in the chat, but I would like to invite folks to, um, you know, unmute themselves and pose any questions to our presenters at this time. Um, I just a real quick question. Thank you for this report. Um, Sussex County Health Coalition uses this um, with our community partners as we plan on the strategies that we want to deploy out in the community. Um, and But one of the things that I have noticed is that there's a lot of uh, things that are coming up with public health. There's going to be a huge fentanyl campaign. Um, there's some other things that are going on. Has there been any thought around looking at when these campaigns are launched? And when they're saturating the community, to see if there's any impact to your reporting um, and doing sort of an overlay between the two to see if there could be a correlation between the changes in the data based on some of the campaigns that are going out. I'm, I'm just curious if there's been some thought around that. That's a, that's a great idea. And I think that uh, right now, as it stands, the, uh, the production cycle for the, uh, the DMI report, it, it, it covers one quarter worth of data and typically we have to wait for toxicology to come back. That's the, uh, the one thing that holds us up sometimes. So typically uh, BMI is produced 60 days after the close of the quarter. So you're looking at a, a quarterly report coming out, you know, in early June for the first quarter of the year. So there is somewhat of a delay, 
Uh, we're working on other efforts. Uh, there's one called OD Map that I would uh, encourage you to look at. That's something we're trying to implement in Delaware. It's okay. a little less, uh, little less thorough than the DMI report, and you sacrifice some accuracy. Uh, it deals with suspected overdoses, but uh, you know you're looking at DMI, and DMI has accurate data as far as uh, supported by toxicology, supported by uh, death findings from the uh, from forensic science, but looking at other uh, other things that are happening, we're, we're hoping that we can have some parallel efforts that will give us greater visibility and uh, greater timeliness looking at overdose, you know, fatal and non-fatal uh, to help steer efforts. So uh, it would be interesting to have a timeline running forward with what you're saying, Peggy, where you have a community event or maybe you have a spike in overdoses, which prompts the community type event or community response and see if you have a measurable impact. But it's definitely something that we could explore, but I would say with uh, it would have to run parallel to DMI. Right. So we've been we having could, Tim, one of the things we could consider though is we could go do a retro analysis based on when those reports have come out, looking at when DPH has maybe put out some of their bigger campaigns and seeing if there's been any change. Um, you know that one doesn't cause the other, but there may be a correlation if we see, if we look at what efforts might be driving some of that, we might be able to see what works best and to replicate it more, right? I think that's, that's, that's the way we should be thinking. Uh, I can throw a couple other things out there just for uh, some thought uh, provoking. Uh, maybe uh, the police have a big takedown. They have a big drug arrest where they take down a network of, uh, of drug dealers and they're the ones putting fentanyl on the street or putting certain drugs on the street. Uh, as we know, this doesn't stop the addiction. It doesn't stop the drug seeking behavior. So individuals will still be looking to get drugs, but maybe not from the person they've been getting it for from for quite some time. So maybe they go to a new source of supply. Maybe that source of supply has, you know, more potent uh, drugs or more deadly drugs, and that could also cause a, uh, a spike in overdoses uh, and death. Unfortunately, another thing that we're looking at is uh, pain clinic closures. Uh, you know, individuals are going to pain clinics to get what they uh, they need, and all of a sudden, maybe if that pain clinic is closed abruptly. It doesn't have to happen just here in Delaware. We've had incidents just over the line in Maryland. We've had incidents up in Philadelphia where they've had a strong client base from Delaware. And that has impact on individuals who might not be able to get you know, their legitimate uh, prescribed medication. So they go to illicit sources. So that's a, another source that may have an impact where if we had this running timeline, we'd be able to see maybe if there were, was a cause and effect. Right. It's, and I think I think thinking of what you're saying, Tim, also, I, I love the idea around this because that then allows us to think from a community perspective, what is our awareness campaigns? What is, um, what are the, some of the other strategies we're doing and how do we thread those strategies for greater impact? And I, I would really be also interested in when we open clinics in specific communities, we've noticed spikes um, within the geographic region of overdose deaths or overdosing in general, right? And we make an assumption about what that is versus people move um, or operate within that area more frequently. Uh, so we have a more concentrated effort of individuals who are. So I, I think that we should look at it on both ends when there's a pain clinic that closes, but then when there's also a clinic that serves that population that opens, has that changed the numbers within that geographic footprint? And if so, that teaches us what kinds of strategies we should deploy as a community within that community when that happens, right? So just just a thought there, but thank you for entertaining those those um, thoughts. And that, that's great. And I think that, you know, coming from a police background and now working with public health, I, I sometimes talk about the same things, but I use different terminology. And we would call that situational awareness. You know, what, what do things look like on a normal day? And then if something changes, you know, you're under maybe a crisis mode, what has changed? And, uh, what has caused that change? So I, I think that's great, Peggy. Thank you. We have um, one of the other conversations from the. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. One of the other things that Tim and I have had several conversations about it through like an outreach um, or just interview of these overdose patients is what did they think they were taking, right? So with uh, with fentanyl, with uh, and touch base with uh, William Lynch's question about xylazine, what did the uh, patient think they were taking? Did they think they were taking Cocaine. We're seeing cocaine laced with fentanyl. Did they think they were taking a Xanax pill, which is now made um, you know fentanyl to be stamped like you know Xanax pills or Oxycontin pills? So it, it's interesting to see what 
what they really think they're taking. That's a great point. And to Chris, answer I William's think. question, I think Tim can agree, uh, can talk on this as well. I think this question came up about maybe a year ago, Tim, about xylazine uh, in the heroin in Delaware. And we reached out to uh, forensic sciences and they started to find samples where there is xylazine in um, the heroin mixtures. And what's interesting about that is if you have somebody that's uh, presenting as an overdose for heroin and they're given the loxalone, they're not going to come completely out of it because the xylazine uh, is not interrupted by the um, opioid blockers of the naloxone. Correct, Tim? That's correct. And uh, Bill, uh, xylazine is, is present in Delaware in uh, many different forms and different types of drugs throughout the state. Uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, this is one of the uh, one of the positive outcomes of our national network also. We uh, we started learning about xylazine and uh, it was kind of on the radar. It was in Puerto Rico years ago and uh, it started making its way to the U.S., particularly on the East Coast of the U.S. And uh, we started asking questions in Delaware. And as part of the DMI partnership, we went to forensic science and we said, hey, are, are you aware of xylazine? And they said, we know it's a, uh, an animal tranquilizer, but we're not really sure if it's you know here in Delaware. We haven't been testing for it because it wasn't really in the category of a drug of abuse. So looking at xylazine right now, from what we know, xylazine is being diverted from legitimate sources of supply. It's not being made in, in you know, clandestine labs like uh, you know, methamphetamine or fentanyl. It's being diverted from legitimate sources of supply. And it's definitely being mixed into the, uh, the heroin supply, or it's, it's, even, it's rough to even say heroin anymore because uh, it's mainly all fentanyl versus heroin. Uh, and from what we're hearing, it's uh, being put in there to give an old school type high to fentanyl, which fentanyl doesn't uh, give the, the same effects as old school heroin would. So it's often referred to as trank xylazine is, or when they mix it with fentanyl, it's, it's known as uh, trank dope. And it is being sought out. And to Chris's point earlier, yeah, it, it brings people down. So people are down if they have fentanyl and they have xylazine in their system. If you give them naloxone, you can negate some or all of the fentanyl, but you're not going to negate the xylazine effects. So it's scary how we, uh, you know, people are just mixing everything and anything together. And uh, xylazine is one of those things, but it is present in Delaware uh, heavily. Any other questions or uh, things we'd like to discuss? Tim, it's actually Bill Lynch and uh, Chris. I just want to ask you, um, I sent you individual chat messages as well, which you can look at when you get a chance and get back to me. But what I was curious about when you mentioned OD map, is it your intention like in New Jersey to use OD form and then with that data to be able to give timely alerts? <clears throat> we actually have it set up. Uh, I'm actually a clinical pharmacist at Jefferson Health System in New Jersey, where we get notified if there's a cluster and an outbreak that either we can report into the system as well as EMS and the hospitals are doing it or law enforcement. And then we're notified within hours if there's a cluster of an outbreak to anticipate those overdoses potentially coming to the hospital and for law enforcement to anticipate them occurring as they're patrolling the streets. So just curious if the intention was not to go to OD map, but then OD form. And once that dumped into the database, you can actually have those things be notified in a timely fashion. Yeah, actually, it's funny because I saw the name Bill Lynch and I was uh, wondering if it was you. I, uh... I was on a meeting with you Thursday, and I actually uh, benefited from your presentation, uh, I think it was a couple months ago, also in New Jersey. And Tim, with actually regards to that, that was actually one of the reasons I'm contacting you and Chris is because of those presentations, if there's a benefit to offer them through somehow becoming more affiliated with DIAC and DMI for Delaware, uh, that xylazine uh, overdose and case history that you're talking about that we just presented. Uh, we presented that nationally on Phoenix. We're actually being invited now to go to other places after that call we had with New Jersey. So if it's a benefit to us, the SEOW, MJ, and also others, we're more than willing to share it because it addressed the fentanyl and xylazine overdose, but also the withdrawal syndrome that occurs afterwards with xylazine, which is actually pretty scary if people aren't familiar with it. We actually uh, took your information as well and passed it on to uh, the DMI partnership uh, with the permission of the uh, New Jersey DMI to our medical community. So uh, there is that, that sharing that's happening right now. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, you had mentioned something about OD map and OD form. Uh, fortunately for Delaware, we have, uh, we have better uh, criminal justice information where we don't need OD form. 
because that, that information already exists within a, uh, within a server that we can access. So we're in a little bit better position than New Jersey is as far as getting all information uh, from criminal justice in one repository. I'm talking about PII. Hey, Bill, can you shoot me an email too? Maybe we can talk a little bit more offline. Absolutely. It's not a problem. I'll just use the, the ones that are in your slides here with Tim Hewlings and Chris. I'll copy Chris on it as well. That'd be great. More than happy to uh, have a further conversation with the two of you to see how we can collaborate and also help help out each other. So that'd be great. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the presenters? Um, you can either pop them in the chat or just unmic yourself. I mean, un I keep saying unmic, unmute yourself and use your mic. I actually have a question um, for, for both of the presenters and that is, um, are you personally uh, observing things that you think are of note that you'd like to share with the network? Any, any takeaways from recent data that you think is, is something that pops out? I, I personally think the, uh, the situational awareness is a really critical piece right now because, uh, you know, when we created DMI uh, six years ago, we were looking at quarterly reports and it, it kind of follows the same lines as crime, crime, crime analysis. You know, 25 years ago, it was great to have a, a monthly meeting talking about what happened last month and, you know, strategies for combating it. But nowadays, it's what happened last night and how we can combat it. So I, I think the evolution of information sharing and the evolution of systems to monitor, I, I talked about a steady state, what is normal when things deviate, you know, whether it be a crime pattern, going back to crime, you know, a string of robberies versus a string of overdose and overdose death. I think that we can use that data to drive our actions. And hopefully, you know, sharing data and you know taking out some of the barriers, taking out the PII, and we don't necessarily need the, the personal identifying information, uh, but we can still use that data, uh, you know, to generally. And then, depending on the audience that we we have, you know, we could use the PII, but, or we could just you know sanitize in some type of fashion where it can still drive actions, outreach, or you know, decision making at various levels. Based off of what Tim said, you know, based on the current um, policing models and strategies that the Delaware State Police uses and some of the uh, portals that we use to share information, where in the past you would come in in the morning and, and see a couple emails about overnight robberies. Now you're seeing emails about clusters of uh, overdoses, three, four, five in a general area in Sussex County, which will then dictate a, you know, a bulletin going out, a you know, situational awareness bulletin, whether it's being looking for a certain stamp or a certain area to uh, try to combat that and get, and get those drugs off the street. That's, that's a good point, Chris. And that's something we didn't mention in our presentation is in between the quarterly reports, if we have something that needs to get out there quickly, uh, we'll put it out through a, a DMI special bulletin. And xylazine was one of those that we actually put out. And then uh, also we had the situation in Sussex County where uh, individuals who were recreational cocaine users all of a sudden you know, found out that there was a uh, fentanyl in their cocaine and actually there was, there was no cocaine in their cocaine it was all fentanyl and they uh you know thank god for naloxone but you know it's just it's crazy how fentanyl is everywhere yeah that yes i mean that is the thing that always pops out i think um just how prevalent that is um we do also like to mention oh i'm sorry oh, i'm sorry Jerry. The, the other thing is uh one pill can kill i don't know if you've heard one pill can kill is an, is an excellent campaign from uh from the dea and I think it's just such an important message because uh, there are people out there that wouldn't use, you know, heroin, fentanyl, you know, things they consider drugs, but they would they would consider taking a pill because they think it's safer. And, and that's it's, those days are over. So I think that's one other thing that's a uh, very important resource is the one pill can kill campaign, or possibly it could, you know, send a message to somebody who may choose not to take that pill, and it could save their life. Thank you. We do have another yeah, but, sorry. sorry. One more. I want to take this last question. Um, I feel like this is really great data. And, and Mr. Hewlings and Sergeant Sutton, I think folks are going to be reaching out. I do want to take this last question before we transition into the next portion. Go ahead, Chair. Oh, I thought you were going to. 
ask that well, question. I, I cut you off. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's. I was just going to point out we had one more question in the chat, and this is from Alexa Meinhardt at DPH. Um, and the question is, can you speak at all to referrals to services and connections to treatment and other outcomes? I can take that, Chris, if you want. Feel free. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is something new, uh, relatively new in the state of Delaware. Uh, police officers, when they go out and they, uh, they handle different things, oftentimes, uh, you know, they encounter a subject who is involved in their behavior uh, due to a substance abuse issue. Uh, oftentimes prostitution, shoplifting, uh, maybe domestic violence, or of course an overdose. Uh, DSAM, Substance Abuse and, and Mental Health, has worked with Delgis, who is the, uh, uh, they hold the repository for police reporting. And there is a referral mechanism where uh, police officers can check a block in a report. And if there's a substance abuse issue, and possibly they'd like to refer it to DSAM, they can check the block and it goes to a, uh, a mailbox in DSAM. And DSAM will actually have that notification from law enforcement. That's groundbreaking uh, in the country to actually have law, law enforcement sending it over for a treatment referral to DSAM. And then DSAM can field those requests. So it's, uh, it's a good example of, uh, you know, multidisciplinary sharing. And uh, it was, I believe, authorized in, in the law for them to be able to share that type of referral uh, outside of law enforcement. We're actually hearing from, you know, the different troops where, initially, you know, when that, that idea was pushed out, people were kind of skeptic of it, but they're saying that it's the relationship is really working out well. And, they're, and you, know, the, you know, the troopers on the road are seeing uh, a positive result of that interaction with DSAM. I can help but wanting to jump in and say thank you for the shout out for the program. Um, I'm Dr. Claire Wong, Associate Deputy Director here at DSAM and uh, have been really proud to be working on this project. And, and um, as Tim said, that it started with the, uh, the LEASE project where um, uh, these individuals are uh, not, well, we, DSAM gets notified through Delgis automatically when an individual fits the criteria. And uh, our crisis intervention services will um, try to do the outreach and try to contact this individual and trying to um, offer them into treatment. Um, over the past two years, um, uh, the collaboration has taken the next step to uh, DSAM now has in, uh, I believe, seven troop locations um, with our case manager, care managers um, on site. So it's now a co-locating um, sort of arrangement and uh, uh, Chris is very familiar with that uh, collaboration. So the warm handoff is even more enhanced now um, since the rollout of that police diversion program, um, uh, I believe our, our data team has registered over 1,200 referrals um, from the state police to the DSAM case managers. Um, and, you know, the, uh, so far, 34% of those individuals who can make a contact and speak to the case managers um, which is a team of two, and usually it's a, con um, a combination of a clinician and a peer specialist. Um, so I think that engagement is really different from uh, just sending us an email and we will cold calling you. Um, so 34% um, of po those people who got the chance to talk to the case managers um, agreed to work with DSAM and 80% uh, of those uh, individuals have now entered treatment. So we're looking forward to uh, continue to collect this information and share with the community, um, but really appreciate the shout out and we're very proud of this, this collaboration in the project. Thanks, Dr. Wong. I saw one, one thing in the chat also uh, from Tatiana. She was asking about Delgis. It's uh, D-E-L-J-I-S and it's Delaware Criminal Justice Information System. Uh, they're phenomenal. They, uh, Delaware's in such a great place because of them having the central reporting everything in one spot for, the, for all police data. It's uh, 49 states are jealous of what we have in Delaware, thanks to Delvis. I wanna once again, thank Mr. Hewlings and uh, Sergeant Sutton for a great presentation. I know I learned a lot. Again, I think there's gonna be a lot of movement and, and sharing from this presentation. So thank you again. Um, I wanna transition into our, our the next section of our meeting. Um, but I did see Dr. Lawler drop in. So I just want to again, shout her out for our data champion. 
Um, again, she she can go back and watch the recording and, and Dr. Lawler and I walk, to, uh, work together quite a bit. So uh, she knows all the great things that I, I think about her and whatnot, but I, I wanna see if there's just a minute if Dr. Lawler wants to jump in and talk about how she uses data uh, on a regular basis. Sure, and thank you for the award and thank you for having me. I wish I had some notice I would have put on different makeup today. <laughs> so let's just start with that. Keep it real in the SEOW, Dr. Lawler. We keep yes. it real. Yes, <laughs> yes, we are working hard to um, one, help our educators know the value of using data, but also to make that data actionable. We are, um, MJ and I are engaged in a number of projects uh, and around the theme of data for truth and action. And I think that really sums up what we're hoping for uh, within the Department of Ed, uh, particularly when it comes to equitable access to educational opportunities. We wanna make sure that uh, the information that we're using is building a case to improve access for students to educational opportunities in school, within the community, uh, but more importantly, that we are as a team uh, you know, of SEA and LEAs using what we know about our communities to inform our practices within the schools so that we are building a culture of care that uh, creates belonging and attachment for young people uh, within our buildings, uh, using our multi-tiered systems of support so that we are universally screening uh, and using our assessment data to attach students to the right intervention practices at the right time so that we are uh, building well-being and mental health access. Uh, there are just, uh, you know, lots of data practices and um, that means that we've got to build our capacity and, and better understand what the numbers mean, but also, you know, how do we create opportunities either through evidence-based practices, um, our instructional practices, every single thing that we do so that kids have the ability to go out and live passionately and purposefully in school and beyond. So uh, grateful to be uh, you know, a part of that work and just grateful to be here with you all because the work that you do really becomes the springboard for us in the work that we're doing. So really happy to be here. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Lawler. I'll, I'll be waiting for your call after this is over for putting you on the spot. My apologies. <laughs> all right. So um, next, speaking of, of, of innovation and community, um, I'm really excited to have our next couple of folks talk to you about the amazing work that they're doing to prevent overdose, to mitigate overdose. Um, and the first one that we're going to hear from is Network Connect. Uh, Network Connect has some really great programs. Uh, they are, are primarily focused in, in Newcastle, but their work is expanding into Kent um, in the coming months. They've got a great um, program for youth, a uh, prevention program called RACE, uh, Reducing Adverse Childhood Experiences, and they do these race kits. I'm sure we can drop the website in the chat so you can connect with them on that level. Um, but because we're focused on overdose today, they're going to share a little bit about um, what they do through their community well-being initiative. And I'm excited to get that started. I believe um, Misha Anderson Thompson is here and can uh, give a few comments and thoughts on those slides. Next slide, please, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, all right. Hi. Good. Actually, so MJ, we had a little issue, so it might say Aaliyah Bass, but I'm Misha Anderson Thompson and Aaliyah Bass. We are both coordinators for Network Connect. And um, thanks, MJ, for um, you know the introduction. Our focus is working with our community well-being ambassadors, and um, we, you know, our goal is to promote community well-being and the resiliency among our residents, and to have an impact to, you know have that overall impact that will impact generations to come. And so our community well-being ambassadors, um, acronym CWAs, um, we establish positive and supportive um, relationships in the community. 
Our focus is to coach community members using um, SPR skills, and that's skills for psychological recovery. That's through motivational interviewing and trauma-informed um, principles. Our focus to help is to help prevent opioid overdose by talking about addiction and distributing the Loxalon kits. So we have community members that go out into the community. We connect with our community members and provide them with this information. Um, we also help individuals and families connect to needed resources within the community. We um, motivate our community members to be active and engaged in par participating in their overall well-being. And what we have found is that we use the SPR skills with our community members overall, but we also find that community um, well-being ambassadors also utilize those skills for themselves. And so that's one key component. Um, we also focus on the prevention by talking about the addiction and the distribution, as I said before. And our ambassadors are equipped to provide um, seamless connections to um, behavioral health through our connections also with Dr. Lawler. And so um, we have five overall SBR skills and that's just building and problem solving, promoting positive activities, managing reactions, promoting helpful thinking and, and rebuilding healthy social connections. And so through Network Connect, we are, as MJ had um, expressed before, we provide the race kits. That's one program that we also have. And we also have a future culture creators program. That's the overall network of Network Connect. Any questions? And I stated before, I don't have my glasses, so I'm going to ask um, Aliyah. <laughs> the to, goal of SPR is to teach survivors new ways mm -hmm. to deal with the stress and improve resilience. So our goal, ultimate goal, mm -hmm. is to get in our survivors to feel like they live in for a purpose mm -hmm. and a reason. Because mm -hmm. okay? some people are lost out there. Yeah. And we're helping them refine themselves. And one big component, I think one of the biggest component is our CWA's community well-being ambassadors connect with community members and they, um, for the most part, because they are in the community, they know people. And one of the things that we've learned is that people in the community trust people that they know. They are not, um, you know, and up to trusting people who are considered outsiders. So I, I do believe that our focus and working with people that already have social capital within the community is one of our biggest component of making this program successful. Yes. Ladies, I wanna thank you. I think the, the takeaway from their presentation, but also their work is the importance of bringing in community into solving um, you know, this crisis and the work of behavioral health is a community. It involves uh, professionals, but it also involves people with that lived experience and people who are, are trusted by those folks. And, and you know, sweat equity and, and a little bit of hope will get you a pretty far away. Throw in some data and we, we've got some power there. So um, ladies, thank you. Any questions for uh, Network Connect at this time around uh, the Community Wellbeing Initiative? I know that Bill put some links in the chat for you all. Thank you. I, I just want to thank you for presenting today and also for the work that you're doing in the community. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very heartening to hear of your efforts and we're very grateful for all of what you're, you're doing within the community. Um, I do want to just mention, Bill is popping a lot of links in the chat and we will, as I think some of you know, we compile all of these so that later on you'll have a resource from the meeting of different initiatives that we've presented. So you can at your leisure read a little bit more about these things and, and take a good look at them later. Um, thank you so much. And MJ? Thank you guys for having us. Yes. and. Um... Aliyah and Misha, if people wanted to hear or learn more about the race kits, maybe get uh, their hands on some, how, how do they do that? Should they go to the Network Connect website or should they email you? They can definitely, I will put um, our emails in the chat, but they can definitely go to the website, networkconnect.org. Uh, we'll also put that in the chat to connect with us. And we can definitely um, have our 
our team on one of our CWAs come out and um, do a little presentation. And we also have those kits readily available to help um, support our young people. Thank you so much. Again, I want to highlight the, 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 I think the key to success uh, with this program is working with community, um, through community, uh, alongside community, um, because as, as Mr. Hewling mentioned, you know, there is this data delay, right? And um, there's a combination between that official data and, and the real time uh, data that folks are able to get through engagement, outreach and engagement. So there's, there's power in having both of those things. So thank you so much again. Um, the next up, we have Sussex County Health Coalition, um, a powerful partner, using that word again, a powerful partner um, who is in Sussex, but is spreading their, their, their work out, uh, who's doing collaborative work with other community organizations, as well as businesses to mitigate and uh, work through prevention to stop uh, overdoses and, and reduce some of those. So I wanna invite Ms. Geisler uh, to the mic. <laughs> Thank you so much, MJ and Sharon, for having me today. Um, so about three and a half, four years ago, we had decided we were going to do an initiative in Little Old Seaford, Delaware. Little did we know it would catch fire. It was based on, and we can go to the next slide, it was really based on um, the fact that we knew we had a real uh, epidemic. And we hadn't really reduced our rates even of alcoholism and other substance use disorders within our region. And so we were gonna tackle it in little old Seaford um, and use the Heron Project, um, their, their Go Purple campaign that we could replicate from Maryland that seemed to be working. And when we brought it to Sussex County in Seaford, the first thing I heard is why is it only in Seaford? We have an epidemic, we need to do something about it. And the community facilitated it moving forward in rapid succession um, and these are some pictures of the different people on our board who were really huge champions um, when we first launched it. So it was a grassroots concept. It was around an awareness campaign that also included informational, but then it allowed the community to engage in tackling this issue along with the state law enforcement. They could be involved in changing their community with all of us. So let's go to the next slide. So we launched this and we decided, what do we need to do? We let the community decide. We did it. We put together a drug free community committee. That committee has statewide organizations. DSAM sits on that and others. We put a community plan together um, and it not only was in the uh, Sussex region by the second year, it was Kent and Sussex County together. And what did that look like? Well, it looked like uh, the messaging that we would be putting out was really around what is out and available? Many people knew we were aware we had an opioid epidemic, but they weren't aware of where to go to get services, how they could be engaged, how they could go get support. And we figured this was a way we could pull all of this together and also get people to be committed in their own communities. By the second year, we had close to 75 to 80 organizations signed up promoting Delaware Goes Purple. And we were pushing out information in the following ways. We had PSAs going out the door. We were being hosted every year on Delmarva Life pro bono. Um, we were um, putting full, uh, we had a, a series of webinars that we were putting out in the community. Billboards went up um, and we had events. When we look at the number of events that our partners hosted, we were talking about 25 and 30 events over the course of October to saturate um, and reinforce the messaging. We included within it DSAM's Help Is Here and started pushing that out, as well as their opioid app through the University of Delaware and any other tools that the state was trying to put out. We were flowing through this huge awareness campaign. Awareness campaigns are really important if you want to change a public health issue. Next slide. So we, um, this past year and the evolution of what had happened is we uh, also had decided we were gonna do Rocket for Recovery and that was slated to go out during the year of COVID. So of course, uh, social gatherings did take place, but we were able to launch it this past May. It was the first time we've had this type of concert. We um, supported over 150 individuals in recovery 
fostered their ability to come through transportation um, and their organization so that they could be out there. We had about 400 and some people out at the event, over 20 um, pro uh, providers of information there. Uh, individuals were referred directly from that event into recovery programs, we were reported. And um, we had a, a host of other individuals there. The Lieutenant Governor has been the co-chair all along on this. Um, what we are seeking now is trying to get this really to start being more purposeful up in the Wilmington landscape. We have reached about 150,000 individuals in the state with this campaign, and we've done all of it through grassroots fundraising and support. But we'd like to take it to the next level because we believe um, this awareness around substance use disorder and it actually not only impacts the opioid epidemic, but also impacts a lot of the other issues we heard about today um, in that report that it's not just the opioids we need to be worried about. There's a whole host of substances and substance use disorder. It continues to be a growing problem in our state, not only for kids, but for adults and those who love them, which we call, um, who are suffering from uh, you know, what we call uh, trauma because they are, are living or associating or being um, in the same household with somebody who has an addiction issue. Next slide. So we uh, want to facilitate, we started working on a, we did do a soft launch. We really appreciate the Delaware Blue Coats and the Lieutenant Governor as we did launch something at the Field House um, uh, several months back um, along with Christiana Hospital and Highmark. Um, and we will be meeting with them again to see how during October when we go purple, there'll be a couple buildings that get lit up in the Wilmington landscape, um, our legislative hall gets lit up purple, our bridges get lit, uh, lit up in the, uh, the uh, Cape Henlopen down in that area. All of our partners go purple. So we're gonna be asking anyone on here if you can do it individually, um, if you can do it for your organization, if you can do it for your community, help us enlist champions um, for this. We provide you um, whatever you need. We, on our website, which will go in there, www Delaware goes purple dot um, org or com, you can find uh, tools there. There's a pledge card. You go to the next slide. There is a pledge card um, that we have there. Um, go to the next slide, um, Harriet, because I think that's what I want to focus on. There's a pledge card that you can fill out online. Uh, people can uh, do at your events. You can put them on your tables. Um, you can print them out yourselves. We have informational sheets that are updated every year. Um, and then we link directly to the Help Is Here website. Um, we wanna make sure that everybody knows that they're part of the solution. Whether they're from their church perspective, if it goes in their bulletin, whether in their school, because we have kids at halftime talking about it. We're linking up with the My Reason Why campaign, working with Scott Michelson on PSAs for kids and promoting that. We put out grants every year in Southern Delaware. I'm looking at Highmark to help us possibly put it out statewide prevention wise up north. So that if you wanna have an event around awareness and prevention, you can do it and it's not cost prohibitive for you and your organization. So in the last four years, we put out close to $100,000 in mini grants, thanks to DSAM and other private funders. Um, we think we can do more of that. Um, and so I'm gonna stop there. I'm going to uh, answer any questions. If you're interested in being on a committee, getting involved in this movement, because it needs to be in a movement. Um, as you know, this did not end during the pandemic. This epidemic continues, and we think we need to be steadfast and dauntless on our efforts to ensure that this goes on. Campaigns like this in other states are they're spending two or three million dollars on. We have literally done all this work each year for under 100,000. That's a heavy lift for our organization. So we're going to be seeking additional resources to make it go statewide. Uh, wish us luck on that. Um, but we think it's necessary. We think we've got something here. All of Maryland has also gone purple. And we've been courted by a couple other states to help them think about how they could do the same thing in their state. So any questions? Any questions for our presenter? I want to thank Ms. Geisler. I have to, again, as a call back, I, I've been in Delaware about five or six years, and, and Ms. Geisler is as relentless about this issue as when I first came. She's honestly always raising that issue right in front of us. 
so we can't look away. We can't look away from the data. We can't look away from what's happening and, and keeping our eye on, on the ball in terms of prevention and addiction and just uh, supporting people where they are. So I, I wanna applaud the work being done down in Sussex and throughout the state um, and open it up to any questions. Ms. Geisler, if anyone wants to, I know we went back to your social media slide, but if folks want to hear from you or reach out to you about any ideas or partnering with you about going purple, um, can we put that? I know that yeah, Harriet Absolutely. Put Anybody who knows me knows I'll return your phone call. So I'll have Harriet put both my um, email as well as my phone number in the, in the chat. Um, you know, I think this is really an important issue. People ask why it's purple. So, so let me explain this really quickly. Um, in the Heron Project, um, and, and he, you, can't, you can't really use a color and, and trademark it, but he used purple as part of the opioid because a, a child in his first lecture when he went out and spoke, um, stood up and said, I'm proud to be drug free. And she was laughed at by her friends. That day she was wearing a purple shirt and he talked about the cur courage it took to stand up in her peer groups and say that this is important to her and this is important to the community. And therefore that's why that color is represented um, across a, a Go Purple initiative. So um, I think it's important uh, we stigmatize sobriety. We stigmatize not being someone who uses substances. Um, we stigmatize those who are addicted. And I think we need to end that. Um, and I think part of it is making sure people are aware that they understand both um, of those, how to be proud and be drug free, but then also how to be proud when you uh, admit that you have an issue and you go seek help. Um, so we'll keep banging that drum. We hope that you uh, will join uh, with your instruments uh, in putting together that symphony for the state. So have a great day. Thank you. That I'm going to, I'm going to hold on. I might steal that Ms. Geisler. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> you can, MJ, what's mine story. is yours. What's Thank mine you, is yours anytime. You know that. When I go back and clean up the recording for the for the website, I'm gonna write it down. I'm like, yes, exactly. So thank you so much. Um, we next slide, please, uh, Miss Riding or Doctor Riding. Sorry. Um, all right. So now we've had some really great data. We've got some really great conversation already starting. Uh, we are gonna jump into some breakout rooms. Um, I set this up last night, so if if it's a little funky, I apologize, but. Um, we're going to jump into those breakout rooms, have that great conversation, and then come back and, and share with the larger group. Sharon, any thoughts before I send folks to their breakout rooms? Um, just one, and that is, first of all, thanks to all of our presenters, of course. You've done a remarkable job this morning of, of showing us full circle. You know, first we talked about the data, and now we talk about how we're using the data at the community level to try to find solutions and to improve our circumstances. So this is really an excellent example of what the SEOW is all about, trying to put that data into action. And I just wanna thank the folks on the ground that are doing that because, um, you know, we like to say the data doesn't mean anything if it's sitting in a drawer or hanging out on a website. If it's not being used, it's not meaningful. So thanks to all of you for being out there and innovating in the community level. So we will go into the into our breaks. Um, MJ, how much time do we have for the breakout room? Oh, I think we've got about 15, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of prompts, uh, but certainly this is probably going to use prompts. Um, the first is always what we are always looking at is, you know, how does what you heard today align with your own experiences and the work that you do and the communities and the populations that you serve? And was there anything that surprises you? So with that, we'll move into our, into our breakout rooms and then we'll join back up in about 20 minutes and report, report out on what we've all um, been observing today. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. As you're coming back, welcome. David, you'll be proud of me. I remember to resume recording. Because I'm good for that too, pausing it and then not turning it back on. Hello, good morning. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you. All right. So I'm excited to hear. Uh, I bet the conversation was uh, really flowing today. I know people have a lot of great ideas and are excited to dig into that DMI report. Um, how about we, uh, Sharon, I'm going to have you go last so that we can just transition into the last part of the meeting, if that's okay with you. Um, room one, what would you like to share out? A key takeaway from that conversation. Yeah, I think I think I was I think we were room one, um, and we talked um, we talked a bit about um, some of the ways the the overdose crisis has has transformed with um, the expansion of fentanyl and different fentanyl analogs and the introduction of xylazine and how that really complicates. Um, the drug supply and what people are using and how you treat that and what um, potential drug um, policy solutions to that might be in terms of making xylazine a controlled substance and, and some of those kinds of things. And then we also discussed a bit about um, just how multifaceted a problem um, the overdose crisis truly is and that how we need um, to address it from multiple sides. So um, not just the law enforcement and controlling drug supply is a piece of it, but also um, working in the communities and supporting recovery and these awareness campaigns and um, harm reduction efforts. And um, you know, all those things are also a really important um, piece of the puzzle. Wow, that's great. Uh, that sounds like y'all really got into some stuff there. Um, Dana, what about you? I think you were number three. Sorry, nobody knew their room number because why would you? I just see it on my, my list. Dana, what about you? or someone from that group? Um, yeah, we, we, we talked a little bit about um, fentanyl, kind of how scary it is, but um, we also talked about um, some of those, I guess what we call protective factors, like community interventions that um, we, we had some people from Network Connect in our group, and we talked about just kind of like, while it's really scary, there's, there's good stuff going on. We also talked a little bit about the shift um, in paradigm from you know, looking at drug um, substance use as a criminal problem only to this kind of multi-factored approach where you have a lot of partners at the table and a lot of um, ways of looking at it. And we were, we were kind of like, well, you know, what else could be there? Um, we talked about just data in general, like what kind of data would be useful to have um, for community members. Um, one thing that mentioned was like you put interventions out in the community, but getting data back about like how effective those are and if they're working and if they're resonating with people. Um, and I think that was a lot of what we talked about, um, but we did talk a lot about just kind of using data and, um, is that it? Great. Uh, room number four, I think that was Dr. Brittingham. Yeah. Um, so we covered how the rocking of the recovery event, um, rocking for recovery event was in fact very, very successful. Um, so shout out to everyone for doing that. But that a lot of the personal stories that people learned at that event, as well as other stories as, as individuals have interfaced with one another, um, those stories are a type of data and do resonate in terms of um, creating, fostering dialogue and fostering resilience um, within communities that as we go towards like understanding through some, uh, as we go into understanding some of these complicated issues, you know, we can take those pieces of information um, to help create strategies for recovery, um, as well as more specifically like environmental strategies in the community. Very often, and our group um, discussed the data some, but also transitioned uh, some of the conversation transitioned to like, what does it mean? How do we implement some of these strategies or what is the data telling us? Like, what's the next step? 
um, because it's going to confirm some of the some of what we know is already in the data, um, but just kind of using it to to target some of the the hot spots um, and to look at it kind of multi dimensionally because what might be happening happening for instance on a parental level it does wind up trickling down for instance to kids um, and so depending on where the focus is you know looking at different different data sources. Um, as well as what's the data saying for like the next step. So, thanks for sharing that. I think you know you've highlighted you all highlighted something really important that you know when we work with one person, we're not just working with that person. We can have that impact um, throughout you know whole families, uh, relationships, communities. So, but thanks for highlighting that. Uh, group number, I think five. Maybe David and Emily were any there. I know probably all of the good answers were taken, but was there anything um, you know that stood out from that conversation? Or Dr. Um, Miller, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I I, I would say the big thing that we talked about was um, just how taken off guard folks are by the whole Trank thing, um, and you know, like the the really devastating consequences of that just kind of appearing in people's drugs without them knowing and I, one of the big things we talked about was like do people even know that this is happening like you know at the community level like is there widespread awareness that that this stuff is finding its way into people's heroin into people's fentanyl into other things um like do the people doing the work to try to help these people know and also do the people who are buying these drugs even know that this is a possibility um so that that I would say this is the big thing that we talked about but if anyone else wants to add please go for it well that, I mean that was a good one that one wasn't taken that was a good I mean that's the thing right we're trying you know the goal the ultimate goal right might be to have people stop using um drugs but do they know what they're taking we have to get there first and i think that that's critical importance in, in making those kind of informed um decisions so thank you for sharing that i think the last one uh is sharon not the last one the best one for last that's what we'll say uh sharon if you don't mind and then you can take us right into the last of it thank you happy to um as as everyone has reported out, um, you know, we we heard a lot of the same things. Um, I think the one thing that our group touched on, which I've heard a little bit of, um, was, you know, the importance of using mapping uh, to identify areas of need, but the importance of understanding um, what kind of mapping is important and for what audiences, um, you know, like, we kind of concluded with a question from Tim Gibbs, which I will now address about um, were we mapping, was anybody mapping like the location of Alana um, AA and NA meetings and things of that nature? And I think sometimes we think of using mapping to uh, identify sources of problems but not necessarily, you know, where are our services and are they aligning with where we're seeing issues? So that's a really good suggestion. Um, we have done a little bit of work on that in the past um, where we're mapping different like treatment centers and things of that nature. And I think that that's a really good area for us to continue to explore. Um, and the other thing that came up was the parallels between youth and gambling and youth and substance use and how important it is to kind of con to continue to consider that there are things like gambling and online kinds of behaviors that we might wanna look at um, as well as the more traditional, traditionally thought of um, substance uh, addiction issues, um, substance use and abuse and, and that sort of things um, because they, they tend to parallel sometimes. And we do cover that in the EPI report that we produce every year. So I just like to, you know, say those are the things that we had talked about in our group. Rachel, I'm going to ask you to end the screen share at this point um, for the moment, because now we're just going to go into network um, discussion. Um, so if you could just stop the screen share and then we'll just see faces because it's nice. It'll be nice to see our network members. Um, yeah, there, there you are. To those of you who can, uh, can, can go on to the camera mode, that's great. Uh, because we really do miss this interactive part of our meetings. Um, 
what with our virtual world. But what we want to do is make sure that you all have a chance to highlight your efforts on along the lines of what we talked about today, but other prevention and advocacy efforts that you might be um, involved in. And we told you in the message, um, you know, about the meeting to come prepared to drop uh links and such in the chats for the resources that you're producing anything of interest that you'd like to highlight and with that i'm just going to say everybody who has something they want to share please just unmike yourself pop it in the chat so we've got those links and and let's just open up the conversation Um, hi, Sharon. So this is Tatiana with Kids Count. Um, <laughs> I'm feeling a little camera shy, but just wanted to mention that I put in the um, in the chat uh, the Kids Count email. Um, for those of you who may not know, you probably um, based on our breakout group, it seems like a lot of people use our data, which is great to hear. Um, but we uh, have a data to action webinar series um, throughout the year in which we essentially focus on specific topics, which can vary from um, economic security to health outcomes, that sort of thing. And if there's anything that you would all like us to possibly highlight, we are looking into potential topics for our webinars in the upcoming months. So, and we are always looking for presenters and that sort of thing. So thank you for having us. We love your data. We absolutely love your data. So thank you. And thank you, Erin, for joining today. Who else has some hot news that they would like to share? Because we know you're all out there and active and we like to circulate that information. So I see that Dr. Stevens popped a link in the chat on academic training. Um, you want to talk about that at all, Sean? I have to find my my mute button there. Yeah, I just um, you know we we've been happy and we're about being our fifth you now doctor of social science in prevention science, um, and it's a totally online program. We'll get people from all over the country. Uh, I think the interesting thing to this discussion, even my role on the Delaware Certification Board, is that I'm finding more and more that uh, there's many programs that are so focused on substance abuse. And yet the strategies and the principles and the frameworks and the theories that we use are relevant to across the board prevention strategies. And, um, you know, we have people from criminal justice, from education, all sorts of things, you know, so so that's good. But it's just exciting that it's something uh, I think the professional um, it's not just an entry level position anymore where, you know, a after school person from a community center gets trained in bullying prevention and does that for a year. You know, it, it really is. It takes a lot more. And so. Um, so we do have one of the few doctorates, social science and prevention science around the country. So I just wanna make sure you're all aware of that. And we are really grateful to have it so locally um, and all the work that Will Mew is doing in that area, along with all of the advocacy around trauma-informed approaches. And absolutely, one of our favorite saying is prevention is prevention is prevention. And we know that when we're intervening in one of these areas that we are often intervening in multiple areas. So thank you for that. I think everybody's been sapped by the heat of July. Well, I, I wanted to mention that, um, and I'm sorry that I don't have the link handy, but the most recent issue of um, the the Delaware Journal of Public Health featured the topic of trauma, which we know is very associated with substance use and some of the things we've been talking about. And if you haven't had a chance, I would just encourage folks to check it out. Um, I don't know if we can get the link for that for the chat, Bill um, or Tim, but I was just really grateful to see an issue on that topic. So if you haven't had a chance, take a look when you do have some time djph.org it's open access don't need to be a member go forth and read
So I'm going to follow up with another question about the DMI, um, Tim, if you if you can. Um, I think you said in your presentation that the report, the data from every agency involved owns their data and the report, how is that shared? Let me just, let me just open it up like that. Uh, can you go over that again? Uh, sure, right now the, uh, the report is shared through the Fusion Center through DIAC and uh, DIAC has a, uh, a pretty broad distribution. There's probably, I think, 4,000 people in the distribution, and it goes out to other fusion centers and other, uh, you know, organizations throughout the country. But uh, the DMI was originally intended to be for, like, decision makers within state government. That was the intent. And then it started going out to a broader and broader audience. And as we watched it evolve, we figured there was nothing in there that could be harmful. So we let it go out to a broader audience. But right now, it's basically through the Fusion Center, through DIAC. So anybody on here who would like to get on that distro, uh, they have one exclusively for DMI and DMI related products. And then of course they have other product lines, uh, law enforcement only or official use only. But uh, there are talks underway right now to make uh, the DMI report more accessible. Uh, it's currently not posted anywhere. Uh, those discussions are being had. Uh, maybe taking the, uh, the, there are handling instructions on, on the current DMI that it's an official use only product, but we know that it is being used by community groups, uh, education, going out to a broader audience. And uh, it's not a bad thing because there's nothing in there that's harmful to the organizations. And it's not letting something out of the bag earlier. Like, you know, we talked about death numbers. You know, we don't wanna have conflicting death numbers. Uh, forensic science, you know, should be the ultimate authority and, and, and publish those in Delaware. Does that answer your question? I think you're still muted, Sharon. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna do that for the rest of the meeting, probably, <laughs> apologies. Um, yeah, this is a group that's really thirsty for data. And so um, we just kind of wanna know where we can, you know, like where folks can get it. So your recommendation was anybody that's interested can um, ask to be on the distribution list for the- yeah. it, If you wanna send it to either uh, Chris or me, okay. we'll make sure that you're, you're on that list. Great. And we have those email addresses. So that's great. Thank you. Well, I will also mention, I know we talked about this before. Um, we do have a short report uh, that will be soon posted on the SEOW website for um, overdose data in uh, Delaware. And we also have a couple of other projects in the pipeline. As you know, annually, we produce an epidemiological report that discusses behavioral health issues that will be coming out um, late, uh, probably early October by the time it's finalized. So you can look forward to that. And in the meanwhile, we did just do a highlight webinar of the data uh, from 2021's edition. So those are on our website if anyone wants to take a look at that along with um, the 2021 report, of course, is up and the infographics. We have a, a suite of um, infographics that you can use for your meetings. Um, you can share them electronically or download them for any kind of, for those of you who might actually be meeting in person with people, how wonderful and exciting, <laughs> but um, you can certainly go ahead and, and download those as well. And then another data product that we have in the pipeline is one that's near and dear to my heart, it's um, behavioral health and older individuals. Um, this is a topic I think that gets overlooked quite often. Um, data is a little tough to come by uh, for this topic, but we think it's really an important, um, it's an important group of people to consider when we're thinking about behavioral health. This is a part of the population that's growing proportionately. And we have done um, a gap report on this population back in, I think, I think 2015, 2016. So we wanna update that and share what we can about um, national trends in Delaware data. So that's something that is in development as well. Um, MJ, any other, anything that you wanna share from the SEOW that maybe, or expand upon that we didn't talk about previously? No, I'm, you know, I'm excited for the new products we've got coming out. As always, we're always, you know, open to exploring different topics, just like Kids Count. So if there's anything you're 
looking for, we remain open uh, for those conversations as well. Um, but I'm, you know, it's summertime, it's Wednesday. We can certainly close early if no one has anything else. Um, Aaron, Aaron, yes. Aaron does have something. I'm ready, I'm ready, Aaron. Aaron, Aaron. Oh, it can be super quick. Um, no, we have time. No, it doesn't have, no, it doesn't have to be. I was just saying if, if there's nothing else, we can, we can close. I totally that support early. that. Um, yeah. Sharon, I know you mentioned the mapping goals. Um, that's kind of something that I'm working to re-up my skill set. Um, so perhaps we can collaborate at some point. Um, some Sal Kids Count maps. And I shared in my small group with Rochelle that um, I'm doing a lot more work on the emerging adult realm. Um, I come from early care, so I always look little, which in many cases is looking at the environment surrounding the child. But we know that these issues um, that we talk about through our Sal groups also affect young adults, and that's their kids. So um, that needs to be discussed. And I think using our mapping tools, if we can do some new overlays, I'm working on a new Medicaid map right now for another hat I'm wearing. Um, Tatiana is going to be um, taking that um, over. And then, but I'm hoping that um, to train her and kind of up both of our skill sets so that we can do a few more this semester. So just reach out, if anything you want mapped, I can see what I can do. Um, and uh, thank you all for your great resources and for Sal for this coordination. These are always really inspiring and really give me a push um, to be in the loop and as connected as possible. So thank you. Thank you. And we will definitely be collaborating with you. We collaborate with Kids Count a lot and we really just relish that, you know, opportunity. Um, so thank you for your, your wonderful resources, Erin, and your, as always, your enthusiasm. Um, so thanks, thanks for that. Anyone else have anything that they would like to share before we wrap up? I think we still have a few minutes if anybody would like to uh, chime in. Sharon, it's Bill Lynch. I just wanted to add some things to address uh, some of the things that were raised during the call and also our breakout session. So Tatiana, if you're looking for a presenter, we're always willing to present. So we can definitely give you some topics if that's what you're looking for for your group. One of the things I actually shared in our breakout, which Rachel was familiar with, is that there's data out there now that was most disturbing about the pandemic, and especially with regards to youth. So what I'd be curious about from MJ and Sharon and your group is to actually look to see how this is mimicked in Delaware, and also Tim and I and, and Sergeant Sutton will have that conversation. So the data actually was from, with regards to alcohol abuse. So it was staggering nationally, it was published in JAMA, was that uh, when we had the pandemic start, there was about 6,000 alcohol-related deaths in the United States. When we went to shutdown for the pandemic, that skyrocketed almost 10,000. But what was most disturbing is they looked at the groups that were significantly affected. First was 35 to 44, second was 25 to 34, but third highest increase in death rates was 16 to 20 year olds. Staggering data, especially when you consider the fact that they don't have quote unquote access to alcohol as far as being able to get it directly. Older people had problems as well, but nowhere near the percentage increases that occurred in young adults and youth. Second to that was the 107,000 overdose deaths that were summarized as well for the year. They also broke that down with regards to a subset study that looked at 14 to 18 year old deaths. From 2000, 2010, I'm sorry, 2019, it was pretty much the same, like 2.4, 2.39 deaths per 100,000, 14 to 18 year olds. But with the pandemic that has skyrocketed to 5.69, 14 to eight year old overdose deaths per 100,000 teenagers in the United States. It's staggering with regards to that impact. And if it's just the deaths from alcohol and opiates you're looking at, what we're gonna pay for with regards to substance use disorder in those age groups for decades because of what has happened is quite significant. So I'd be curious to challenge SEOW to see if there's a subset both for those overdoses from both alcohol and those substances is significant. And going back to what uh, Dave Borden raised about people knowing what's in the drug supply, they do not. What's interesting is that a very good colleague of mine who was the first medical director from the Office of National Drug Control Policy in California, California is going to mandate that hospitals actually test for fentanyl in individuals who overdose when they come into the hospital. Now, the reason it's important is she has a great comment and she says, if you identify somebody who's overdosed and you take care of them, you're a good emergency room doctor. But if you identify in their drug supply that it was fentanyl that they were exposed to, a lot of times, like Dave alluded to, unknowingly, 
I just thought I did cocaine. I just thought I did marijuana. I just thought I did methamphetamine. And you actually overdose on fentanyl. It's significant with regards to knowing that. That encourages people to get naloxone in case they get exposed to it again. It encourages people to seek treatment for the fact they got exposed to an opiate. All these kinds of things are actually interesting. And then with regards to xylazine, the pharmacy residents that I had, we were shocked in that we actually went to a national meeting of clinical pharmacists from across the country in Phoenix, Arizona. And the number of people who came up to our poster and said, what's xylazine? They not only didn't even know what it was, let alone what class of drug it was, and that it was actually in the drug supply. And what's important is that, and you know, I'm sure Tim can allude to this as well, is that it's being used to cut methamphetamine, cocaine, and all kinds of substances, not just opiates. And it's significant with regards to people not being known that they're exposed to that. And we mentioned in a breakout session to Rachel, you can actually test for it. Hospitals hardly have this at all, but you could send it out if you really needed to, that there's actually hydroxylate metabolite of xylazine that is detectable in human urine to know that someone truly overdosed on xylazine. And the reason that's important is because you have to anticipate they may go through withdrawal from the xylazine. And also there's a significant risk for skin infections from actually using xylazine based on where and how they inject. So I just want to give those as summaries based on some of the commentary that we raised today. Um, and if people wanted more information about that, I was say it was, I was very happy to hear, we mentioned the breakout session, Tim, that you thought the information was very valuable from last Thursday and shared it with other people across the state of Delaware. And if they want more information on that, that's fine because it has really significantly impacted the drug supply uh, in the tri-state area. And as Tim mentioned, it's really a Northeast and Mid-Atlantic problem. And when we were out in Phoenix, people from the middle part of the country. We actually had someone come up, we're going to Atlantic City to present this information in New Jersey because she didn't know what xylazine was, even in the drug supply actually in the state we know it's running rampant in this tri-state area. So that's how significant it is to really address Dave's question about do people really know this and they really don't, they don't know what's out there. And we mentioned to Rachel as well that um, New Jersey has already identified in our drug supply that we have 40, 40 different fentanyl analogs that have been identified in the drug supply in New Jersey. And I'm sure that it'd be interesting to find out from Tim how that correlates in Delaware. And I'm sure there's significant analogs as well in the state of Delaware. And that's important because when people want to use fentanyl test strips, and I understand the harm reduction process, and there's benefit to that. But the caveat has to be that if it's a fentanyl analog, it may not be identified in your fentanyl strip when you actually test the drug supplier consider using. And that's an important thing for individuals to know if they're going to consider using a certain amount of a drug supply that they may not know or get false sense of security. It's not tainted with fentanyl when it actually is, but a fentanyl analog that wouldn't be identified. So that's just a quick summary that I want to add to the for the end of the meeting. But thank you again for having these. We always appreciate it. I apologize for not using video all the time. You can see by that tired face, it's been up since about six o'clock last night because I worked over the hospital overnight shift. So thank you again for having us and appreciate the time. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. I appreciate you. I always appreciate uh, you elevating our awareness around different issues um, and challenging us to go deeper into the data. Uh, don't worry about looking tired. I think we all are, or at least wilting from the heat. There's a few of us. Um, but as far as your question around um, the data, you know, we work hand in glove with our colleagues doing the school uh, surveys. And so we can look at some data. Obviously, there's not death data in there, but we can um, look at certain elements. They are have cleaned that data. They're preparing that data uh, for dissemination in the coming months. So we'll be we'll be in touch and we'll be pushing that out. And MJ, I'd just be curious, even if just the questions were posed, were youth in the survey that you guys are doing or young adults? hospitalized or went to a hospital or treatment center regarding a situation that occurred? Because I think you're going to see that there's actually a jump in that as well. We've definitely seen at the hospital more people coming. I'd be curious if you surveyed that, does it correlate to the youth data nationally and what's the impact in the state of Delaware? So I would invite um, Dr. Brittingham to put her email in the chat so you can talk with her directly about the school survey. There is a question on the Delaware school survey about um, have you ever, I'm going to get the wording wrong, so I apologize. Have you ever sought treatment or been hospitalized or been seen in the emergency room for, and there's multiple uh, responses that people can give. So um, we can definitely dig into that and have further conversation. Uh, I do want to honor uh, folks time since we are a little bit over time now, uh, but we'll keep digging in and, and touch base with you, uh, Dr. Lynch. Great. Uh, thank you. MJ, before we wrap, um, uh, Terry Lawler, you had your hand up and now it's down. Are you, did you still? My apologies. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it, it, it's still up. I'll take it down. But I just wanted to say that uh, the data that Dr. Lynch referenced has implications for our student body as well as our young um, educator workforce. And so 
I don't know if we are looking at any um, data about the teacher workforce, but I think it will be really interesting. And I think it, it's a great growth opportunity. Um, some information, I think MJ, that you shared with me recently stated that uh, when young people in adolescence are uh, exhibiting symptoms, it may take 10 plus years before they get support. That is our new teacher workforce. So I think it's important for us to kind of um, expand our reach and hopefully provide supports for them as well. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, I think it's really an important consideration. And I also think, you know, we have to constantly remember when we're, when we're looking at quant, let me, sorry, quali quantitative data, it gives us a place where we can start to ask questions. We have to be careful about how we interpret what we see. Um, like, you know, I think we need to consider all the data that we're getting around the pandemic um, as very new data and that it's a snapshot of what's going on, but it doesn't necessarily tell us the why of some things. So we need to couple that with some qualitative efforts and, and observations about what's happening. But I appreciate it. And in respect of everyone's time, I think it's time for us to wrap. But once again, a very robust discussion great presentations from our um, guests today. Thank you so much. And we're just very fortunate to have such a diverse and dedicated group of stakeholders in this network. Uh, we'll be back to you when the materials from the meeting are available and posted and let you know where you can access them and share them with your other colleagues. And thank you so much. Uh, we'll be having another event, um, another webinar, a 3D webinar sometime this fall. And we will certainly let you know when our new publications are posted. So thanks to everyone. Anything else, MJ, before we wrap? No, ma'am. I think folks are ready for lunch. Okay. Take care, everyone. Stay cool. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you.